I should be able to see my um, internet screen. You should, you should be able to see my screen. Um, the ETS website is the best resource to prepare for the exam, hands down. These are the people who are making the exam and their resources to prepare are the best resources. What I found very helpful is um, their study resources and their study um, I guess their study plan. So let's go to their study resources real quick. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. So I might need to also share this particular screen. Stop share. Share screen. Okay. So if you go to their study resources, there is a Microsoft Word document and they are regularly building this. I think the last time that Ms. Perkins and I facilitated a workshop that there were not as many videos. If you click on any of these links, a Khan Academy video will appear. These these videos might be anywhere from like two to six minutes and they're quick um, descriptions, explanations, um, ex, you know, analysis of various concepts that you will be tested on. My suggestion is to use this particular document as your primary prep for your plan of action. You can move it around. See, I just moved it like that. And you can also add a little section right here to your right, and then you can put notes. You know, you can put something like um, feel, you know, like uh, feel comfortable, or you can just put check it off or something like that. Need to review um, additional, whatever you, you want to put on the side. So my suggestion is to go to ETS, definitely download these um, resource guides and view all of the videos they have. They're short, they're quick, they're really precise. They get to exactly what they're looking for. And they have a ton of them, as you can see. There's a lot of videos on here for you to use to prepare. And as you're looking at it, you can see that there's different parts of the exam that you probably should be focusing on. For instance, understands characteristics of common types of writing. These are things, um, little like subheadings that you should consider thinking about as you prepare for your exam. For, for myself, like I feel really confident with the research. I know the research process. So I would just put, you know, completed or, you know, confident. And so download this. And if you, if you also like saying, hey, you know, instead of looking at all these videos i know if i just watch you know i think some of you guys said that you're watching kathleen jasper's videos um maybe you want to put a link to kathleen jasper's video right there instead so i'm going to stop share and go ahead and i am uh, miss perkins i'm gonna just do my powerpoint and so you join with your PowerPoint. So that will put me right here. Share screen. I think it's just easier if I just pull up my whole desktop. And. Oh no, I lost my, okay, there we go. All right, so let me go to slide two. All right. So if you go to the ETS website, there is a ton of resources. We and the Office of Teacher Education and Clinical Practice feel like this is the most effective of approach to preparing for the exam if you go directly to the source which is ETS and use the materials that they offer in their study guide read this as the, the study guide thoroughly 
um, so that you're familiar with the test. A lot of successful test takers understand what the test is assessing, meaning that they know exactly what to expect. They know, you know approximately how much time that they're gonna have for the questions, and they can create a pace and preparation for their exam. Like I said earlier, you're going to have 80 questions and you will only have 90 minutes to complete those questions. These questions are gonna span reading, half of it's gonna be reading, but then the other half is gonna be writing, speaking, and listening. And it's really not too much difference. You know, some, some exams of like, for instance, social studies, there's like a lot of attention to US history, very little attention to sociology, but for the most part, it's just reading, writing, speaking and listening but if you want to go to that um, initial sub test um, where i shared with uh with you all those resources then you can kind of hone in on certain areas and we'll talk about those areas today quick question how many questions are you going to have you can just shout it out if you know it or you can put it inside the chat That is correct, Brittany. Thank you. Yes, you have 80 questions. What does this mean for you? How many, how many minutes do you have per question? This doesn't have to be exact. In a minute? That's right, around a, a minute. And so um, you're gonna have to, to like develop uh, an internal pace that you need to approach each of your questions. You know that you, you have approximately one minute per question. And some questions you may have like a long passage and some questions you'll have a short, you know, small multiple choice question. So for the small, like this, the multiple choice questions, you wanna hone and get those in like around 30 seconds or 40 seconds so that for the questions that you have with the longer passage, you have a little bit more time. Each question counts the same um, and you already know the broad overarching areas is reading, writing, listening, and I think those are the main things. All right, let me see if I can go to the next slide. All right, so um, most of you guys have expressed an interest in you know, taking the exam over the summertime. If you are not aware, the University of Memphis has an on-site testing center. I strongly encourage you to use the on-site testing center because I think it's kind of hmm, alluring to, to take the test at home, but there's so many issues that I've heard students say that they have encountered over the last year with taking the test at home. So we want to encourage you to take the exam at an official, you know, ETS site and, um, you know, so that you're in a space. If you have any questions with Internet, everybody's there to help you. We also have a ton of resources on our website. I think you guys are all familiar with those. Uh, this is a link to Khan Academy, Praxis Core, Praxis, you know, the Praxis Core has elements for the reading and the writing, but if you just go to that, you know, um, Praxis resources, Praxis prep resources that I just showed you, it has the links to the Khan Academy videos. ETS um, has a ton of resources, and that's the one we're primarily um, pushing, uh, 240 tutoring. Um, we already said Khan Academy, but we also have some, you know, a lot of people are using Kathleen Jasper. And for the first time I've heard Exam Edge, there's a ton of resources. And I think if you just go to our website, you'll see that there's even more. And we have a lib guide, which is a library guide. If you just type in the University of Memphis library guide praxis, um, you'll see that we have free books in the library for you, so you don't have to purchase any. And those are, you know, hard copies, but we also have electronic books for, you know, students who would rather take, you know, look over books at their at the convenience of their house. The, the majority of the questions on this exam is multiple choice. They're all multiple choice. And um, so this means you're gonna need to read the questions and all the answers thoroughly. 
Um, you'll also want to verify your answer with substitution. You want to eliminate, a, you know, any incorrect or, you know, process of elimination that will narrow it down to help you get the top choices and limit your answer to the choices that, that are given. And here's some tips. So number one, skip the hard questions. You don't have time to be thinking about, you know, um, questions very long. So if it's like, if you're looking at it and it kind of seems complex, like you don't understand what they're asking for, or you don't understand, or you, like you just don't understand the answers or what the answers could be, skip that question because you know you can always come back to that and sometimes you know in the process of answering other questions you'll get some hints to what the question the answer is for the one that you skipped so skip the hard questions um check your answers and read the questions and all the possible answers thoroughly so make sure that you know you're reading the answers thoroughly sometimes the answer is like part of it is correct and you may be tempted to go ahead and say that's the answer but maybe the second part of it isn't correct and so make sure you're reading your answers um your answers very thoroughly keep track of time remember i said like this test is really about how well you take the test it does not really assess very much um, other than how well you some basic general, you know, information, but it really assesses how well you take the test. I have students that could, you know, receive an A plus, could knock out, you know, a social studies, you know, classroom or an English and language classroom. But when it comes to the test, they, you know, like the their timing and their pace is not on point. So a lot of you know students don't do so well because they're not paced they, they haven't learned the pace and then with that said i also want to encourage you to like i know there's sometimes there's questions that are a little confusing you feel like they're tricking you do not let that do not let that stress you because that layer of stress is causing is taking away from the energy like the brain power that you could be using to answer your questions and between that layer of stress right and as and the i guess your pacing um how you pace your exam that could like really impact how well you do on the exam so the more you practice right the more you practice the easier it is for you to get your pace as well as um it you know the more calm you'll feel when you take the exam all right we're going to start with just a few questions that I want you to um, kind of look over and we'll talk through them. So Ms. Perkins included those questions in the chat. If you can go ahead and click on the link and try to do as many as possible. Let me know if you do not have, um, let me know if you don't have, okay, uh, if you can't get access to the link. We are gonna do the test for 10 minutes and try to pace for 10, try to get 10. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start the timer. Oops, go back.
So we have a couple more minutes, okay? Okay, so I have us at 10 minutes now. If you could wrap up your questions. I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the first part of this exam. All right, so which covered foundational skills? Let's see if I can move to my next slide. All right, so this particular portion of the exam really went over phonological awareness, understanding how sounds and syllables and um, word parts can be orally manipulated to break apart words, create new sounds and rhymes. I think all of us remember in elementary school, um, just like how we came to learn to read. And the most basic part of the reading is called the phoneme. And that is just the, you know, the smallest unit of sounds. So when you think about a word, it has, there's 44 different phonemes that could be drawn from, you know, just the English language all these different sounds and these sounds come together to make words and sometimes those um, words consist of just one letter and sometimes they consist of multiple letters those ones that consist of multiple letters are called diphthongs which is um you know just two letters together making up a word like sh or ch and so when you're teaching someone how to read, it's, it's important that you're mindful of how, you know, we listen to words and how they sound and um, the smallest unit of those sounds are called phonemes and they could be substituted. So if you have, you know, I remember when I was teaching my kids how to read and, you know, a lot of the books had very similar words, you know, um, cat in the hat, right? So you have k at. So all of those, the k at is the phoneme, right? And you can replace that, you can substitute that, right? And come up with hat, at. And so a part of, you know, teaching and learning, you know, um, how to read and um, is the understanding of how central phonemes are. These, when you're teaching your students how to, you know, read hat and you go at, or read mat and you go mm, at that's called segmentation the separating of sounds and you might do this a couple of times with your students you might be like okay so you know i'm reading a word and it's like and it sounds like mm, at right that's typically how we teach we we segment we segment it what does mm, at sound like and so sometimes we do that and sometimes you know if we're um, not substituting we're just deleting a part of the the phoneme right so m at mat and if we take off the m we have at 
we can replace the, the M with the S and then we have SAT. So this first portion of the foundational skills is phonological awareness. These are the main areas that elementary educators need to understand um, when they prepare for the exam. Let me go to the next. I would, I would just like to add a little bit uh, to that. So when we do this out loud, segmentation and uh, phoneme blending are some concepts that are a little bit difficult sometimes to differentiate. So what you want to make sure that you do uh, when you're thinking about the difference between segmentation and blending is what you're asking the students to do. So segmentation is separating the sounds and words, and then blending is putting those together to make that sound. So when we say, when we separate uh, the M, the A, and the T, then that's segmentation. When we're blending, then we're saying at. We're putting that together. So make sure in your notes that you also add uh, blending. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for sharing that, Ms. Perkins. So a part of understanding, you know, of having, I guess, phonological awareness is understanding that letters come with certain sounds, right? So you have your short vowels, and typically when you teach this, you want to teach your short vowels before you teach the long vowels. Um, you also want to teach letters similar in appearance like B and D because, um, you know, sometimes students can get those confused and letters that sound similar to one another like M and N. And then also letters with multiple sounds like Y or when you put the two L's together and they make their own sounds. And as, you know, a teacher, you want to make sure you follow this particular progression. Um, because, you know, it's difficult for students to learn, you know, how to put, you know, words that sound together like E and A before they understand like, ah, Do you, like I said earlier, like all the earlier books that you learned and, you know, kindergarten, they had like the cat in the hat, you know, or just really um, Jane and, you know, Jane went up the hill, like just they went in, pro they went slowly up to more complex words with, you know, um vowel um two double vowel consonants like the e and the a or the i and the e and so forth another thing that teachers use is sight words and you know depending on what class you're in you might have some teachers include like maybe a uh, sight words uh, yana you can join in right here i think your mic I'm is sorry. Off. it's okay i meant i meant to put my here. Oh, okay. Uh, but but I I can add on a little bit uh, to this because we're talking here about onset and rhyme, right? So who can tell me what the onset of a word is? Think about that word on and then also set, right? Mm -hmm. Brittany, I see you what? unmuted. Is it the beginning two letters of the word? So the beginning sound. So when when you think about phonological awareness, we're we're referring to sound. So sometimes it are it is the first two letters, but in a short uh, a shorter word, it might just be one one letter. So it just depends on the beginning sound. So we have the onset. So what's the rhyme? What's left? What's left? The last sound of the word? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, so that's usually followed by those vowels and consonants. And those create patterns. So that's what Dr. Tillis is referring to. And so um, some of the common patterns is, are like the vowel and the consonant, the at, right, or the its, um, and then the vowel consonant consonant like all and also I think the most common I get a lot you know consonant vowel consonant consonant like back or desk or um I can't think of any others right now but there are um other you know you probably seen them everywhere lamp that's a good one and so those are the consonant vowel consonant consonant 
At this time period, we're going to ask you to kind of just think through your questions. We're going to review questions one through seven and nine, and we'll just go over each of those questions. And remember, you know, this, these questions are really hitting on what's a phoneme, substitution, segmentation, deletion, and also high frequency letter sound correspondence, sight words, and phonics progression. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Ayana, do you think we should go ahead and share the questions? Do you want to, do you have that open? Can you share it? Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will share that now. All right, you all are, that you all are seeing the, um, one second, I'm going to share the correct screen here. There we go. Please let me know when you're able to see the screen. <laughs> I can see it. Can you increase the size just a little bit? Absolutely. Thank you. So you all don't have to take out your magnifying glasses. There we go. All right. Is that big enough? Just it's still it kind of out. small, but you know, I still have my own copy on me. So. Well, I would like for everyone to be able to see it, so you all don't have to switch back and forth between screens. So I'm gonna try to make it a little bit bigger here. There we go. All right. That's my there we go. Yeah. So if you could, um, I think right now would be a good time to do. Do you all feel comfortable talking out loud? If you don't feel comfortable, you can put the answers in the uh, chat. Feel, you know, that's also just fine. So the first question was a teacher asked, what word am I trying to say? P -in. And instruct students to say the word. Which strategy is the teacher using to build phoneme awareness? Okay, we got, uh, is it Kayla? I think Kayla said A, Desiree, Desiree said C. Okay, so I wanna hear what is your rationale behind each one? Okay, so um, Desiree, you said A and what, I think you're working right now. So I don't know, I think my ask phoneme. Um, I think we have somebody else who said A. Um, Anita, or no, no, Kalea, you said A, I'm sorry. Kalea, why did you choose um, A? Um, it really was a, a educated guess. I haven't heard of blending until uh, Ms. Perkins just said something about it um, right now. But I just tried to use process of elimination and whatever sounded correct to me at the time. Um, so that's what led me to A. Thank you. I like that process of elimination. We also have someone who said C. Um, we have Desiree and Mia. And Desiree says C divides the words into segments by sounds. Yes, that is dividing the word into segments. But we're going to go with A. And um, A, it's the answer is A because it says, what word am I trying to say, right? She's asking the students to, um, to sound out, right? What word am I trying to say? So she wants them to in, the, she, what is she doing? She's asking that they blend these words together. So that is phoneme blending when you're asking the students to blend the phonemes together. That was a hard one. That one was a little tricky. So I can see how phoneme segmentation is, is um, take, you, get, you can easily think that's phoneme segment, segmentation. The next one is which letter or word part forms the rhyme in the word cake? So we think about cake. What rhymes with cake? We have D from Mia, D from Desiree. Um, we'll go with Mia. Mia, what made you choose D? Um, I knew that the rhyme is going to be the last sound, and ache is a, um, I forgot the word, the, you know, like the family, I forgot the word, but it's like a family, so you rhyme with it, so there's more words that can be. Um, rhyme with ache. 
Yes. I also, the one way that I knew that is like, you always want to think about the end, but you know, we know that cake rhymes with bake and ache and, you know, I don't know if ache necessarily spelled the same, but we do know that, you know, cake rhymes with bake, right? And so um, if you just substitute that C with a B, you get, you know, that end part, which is the rhyme part. So save uh, question three for my, uh, my part. Okay. The next question is how many phonemes are in the word chick? How many phonemes are in the word chick? What's the answer to this one? We have answer A, answer B. I don't know if Brittany, you were saying B to this one. For number four? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I was saying three. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So how did you, why did you choose three? I think I broke it up into syllables. I think that's why I said three instead of, because it's two, isn't it? No, no, you're right. But I want, I don't want you to think about it in terms of syllables, right? Because syllable will be like, you know, right? Ch ick. When you're teaching it, you want to be like, ch, ick, right? That's what you typically do when you, you teach it. And the phoneme is like the most basic sound. So the ch is making its own sound. The i is making its own sound. And the k is making its own sound. So it's ch, ick. There's three phonemes in, in chick. So it's a little bit different yes, from syll syllables, right? I think that's good though. Yes, I hope that helps. All right. And the next question is the CL in the word clap is an example of number five. What is the CL an example of? We have Brittany. Um, and Brittany just answered a question. See if anyone else can get this one. Thank you, Brittany, though. The CL in the word clap is an example of okay. All right, we have some other answers on here, Maritza. You said B, and Kalea, you said B. Maritza, since we haven't heard from you, why did you choose B? Um, I chose B, um, the onset, because it's the initial phonological unit of the word, or the beginning of a word. That is correct. That is correct. And so the beginning sound is always the onset, right? Think of that onset at the onset, right? It's the beginning. So great job. All right, so we're on six now. A student is able to orally substitute an initial, initial consonant, G for B, in the word boat to make goat. What concept is a student, um, concept is a student demonstrating? What concept is a student demonstrating? Does anyone um, else? We have Mia. Mia, what concept is a student demonstrating? Um, I took a guess on this one and said D, manipulation of onset and rhymes. And the reason I picked that is we're changing that first sound and replacing it with another sound, but it's the same rhyme. I, I did the same thing too, but let me check with Ayana. Ayana, are we good on this one? Is it D? So um, it's A, phonemic awareness. And that's really what we've been talking about um, this the phonological and the phonemic awareness. Then 
awareness and that's referring to phonics so just being able to manipulate those words i do understand why you said that but if you think about it they're not if they're doing that they're not manipulating the rhyme at all as you said so it's not a man manipulation of onsets and rhymes although it does involve that onset um so i would think that you all would um struggle between phonemic and phonological awareness uh, but the answer, the correct answer is that A, phonemic awareness. Uh, we do know that it's not letter sound correspondence. And uh, for that reason, I just explained it's not D. So you could also kind of use process of elimination there. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I think when I first, when I initially came across this question, I was also, I, I chose D because I felt like, you know, they're changing the onset and they rhyme together. And, but I think ultimately, you know, it really shows the student's grasp of phonemes and, you know, hence the phonemic awareness. So the next question that we're going to have you guys um, will discuss is seven and then I think we'll move. Are we moving forward to the next part? Because we're at yes, four. The next okay, so yes. which of the following letters is most likely to be introduced first in the progressive phonics instruction which one would you introduce to your students first in phonics instruction and this is not um an easy one either i want you to think about when you learn Sounds. Thank you. Thanks. When you learn the alphabet, right? Okay, so for this particular question, I think initially I had, um, I was thinking A, right? Because it's like, ooh, A is like probably one of the earliest, you know, sounds that I've ever, you know, recall, but it could also be M, right? Who, Maya, wonderful job. Why do you think it could be M? Okay, this is how I just thought about it, but initially I did have A, and then after you said it was not A, then I was like thinking M because one of the first words I hear babies say is mom or dad, like mama, mama, mama. And so then I went to the M. N is also very consistent. M is always M, mm, right? A can be A, it can be A, ah, it could be like, you know, used differently. And so I think, um, so one of the first um, instructions, like the first, you know, words that you want to teach your students about phonemes is m because it's consistent and it sounds just like you say it m, you know so uh that is the answer to that question the correct answer is d and why is a little bit difficult because there's always these exceptions right sometimes it sounds like an e sometimes it sounds like a y and um, the same for g g can sound like gina right and it also sound like gina or gilbert or whatever it may be so um, m is the first um the correct answer for that all right so we're going to move on to the next portion of our workshop all right and just uh, we do understand we're mindful of the time. Uh, we do understand that the time is now five o'clock. So if you all have to go, then that's that's perfectly fine. This workshop was actually intended for in-person two hour session. So we have a lot of information that we uh, hope to cover, but we're only going to be able to cover uh, one more section of foundational skills. And we will be having these uh, other sessions in the future semester. So just keep that in mind. I just want to give you all time if you have to jump off to go ahead and jump off. And if you can stay a few more minutes, wonderful. We plan to end around 515 or 520. You can leave any time. So just keep that in mind as we're going through. And we also are going to stay on a few minutes if you all have questions. We want to be able to answer those questions. All right. So we are transitioning into some of the more difficult 
foundational skills. And as uh, Dr. Tillis talked about, foundational skills are what you all will, this is what you'll be in the classroom teaching and working through. So it's very important for you all to understand those things. I'm going to uh, switch my screen so you all can see my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Are you all able to see this okay? Yes, we can see it. I can see it. Okay, wonderful. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, root words and language acquisition because root words are something that you will be teaching to help students to unlock language, uh, usually in the later grades, but sometimes I've noticed now in the earlier grades, students do learn about these base words, um, affixes and suffixes, because as they learn those, it's going to help them with their reading. We're also going to talk a little bit about fluency. Um, and what that means. So let's start with the Greek and Latin bases of words. So this was something when I was in third grade, I used to love this uh, because it really does help you to learn things. You're learning kind of a different language. These are parts of our language that um, the English language that has been incorporated over time. So cent, for example, means 100, right? What are some other examples of root words? You all can drop it in the chat or say it out loud. What about mono? What is what is mono? M O N O. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Desi. Duo. So desi means what? Does anybody know? Very good, 10, duo. What's duo? Two, very good. All right, so we have kind of an idea. I think that try, so try, uh, that is one that does mean three. And that's a good one as well, but that also can be looked at as um, an affix. So uh, we're, we're pretty good on those, I see. The root words, I want to help you all differentiate. The root words are going to be where they can stand, they can really mean something on their own. Um, so just keep that in mind. That's the difference between those and affixes. So affixes are prefixes and suffixes. So they're added to the beginning or the end of words, and they create meaning. So for instance, pre. Pre means what? in a word. Before, very good, before. That's awesome. So that's kind of what you want to think about. You want to think about those prefixes and suffixes. And we won't get too deep into that because more than likely you have a general background in it. But if you don't, these are pretty easy to uh, study. You can use a website called vocabulary.com that has many uh, words and lists that you just run through so that you can start to get a feel of those. Uh, the Praxis won't really ask you a lot about the actual prefixes and suffixes. They're more so asking about the concept. So as long as you understand the concept and how they work, how they will help students to unlock language as they're learning to read and write and speak, that's what you're looking for. When it comes to reading fluency, uh, fluency is the ability to read automatically. So that means that you're going to have the correct rate, the uh, ability to accurately say the words, and prosody, which is where you have the different range of vocal expressions. So rate is speed and fluidity. So I like to think about that as flow as like if you watch running water versus the choppy reading that early readers might experience those emerging readers they might read each word um, and at the speed that makes it harder overall to understand when they're starting out so you do monitor that rate as you're teaching then we have accuracy that's where when a student looks at a 
word that they haven't seen before, especially, they're able to look at those prefixes and suffixes and root words and use their prior knowledge to be able to say that word accurately. And then we have prosody. So prosody is the range of vocal expression. So there's a sentence here. I usually have um, my students to read this if we're in person, but I will read it for the purpose of time. So if I read this, I declare an angry woman's dream running out of the burning house. You don't get an idea of what, what I just read, but prosody adds the, ex, the explanation points. It adds uh, feeling to where it says anger. So the student's able to kind of read a little bit ahead and know, okay, this is how I'm supposed to read this. So I declare the angry woman screamed, running out of the burning house. So putting that additional excitement, that production into reading is something that a fluent reader is able to do. Um, so that's something that you want to think about. Those are a lot of words, right? And there are some Yes. I was going to say, sometimes if we don't have good prosody, it could change the meaning of the sentence. So like if you're just reading this without thinking about the prosody, you could be like, I declare the angry woman scream. Do you know? Like mm -hmm. it could it could influence how the audience is interpreting what you're um, reading. So it's important to, to make note of that from your students and how they're reading all of the the, the sentence, um, including the punctuation. That's, that's yes, all thank you for thank you for bringing that up. Especially for our um, our readers who are strong readers in terms of rate and accuracy, so they know how to read and they can read it fast, but they might not. Uh, they might have to work on prosody. So I've noticed with some students, they might read the sentence super fast, so you don't actually get an idea of what it says, and they might be able to read it but not understand or comprehend what it's saying. You know to be able to put in those vocal ranges and expressions. So that's something else to look out for. Yeah, it's so I did. Of, I was gonna say, it's a good sign of comprehension, right? Mm -hmm. It is, it is. Thank you for adding that. So I did add an example for affixes uh, because I just think that they're just a powerful way of unlocking um, vocabulary for students. So we take the word accept, we can add a prefix. So the root word is accept. The prefix is un. What does un mean usually? Before. So un usually means not. So before would be like pre, right? But un usually means not. So if I say that something is acceptable, and a bowl is actually a suffix. So that's, a, that's at the end of a root word. So it's able to be accepted. If I put un in front of it, it changes the whole meaning. It means that it is not able to be accepted. So just with the uh, prefixes and suffixes, now we're able to understand this word and what it means a little bit more. The next piece that I'm going to very quickly go over because I'm uh, looking at the time right now are the foundational skills of language acquisition. Now, I need you all to hear me on this, all right? This is challenging only because there are many ways that the stages of secondary language acquisition is explained. So let's say you have a student, their first language is not English, then they go through different phases. So they might be able to actually uh, speak some words, but not many words. They might mix their words up. These types of things are stages that are clear here, but that's not really what happens when you're in the classroom with the students. They may have pieces of early production, they may have pieces of speech emergence that they're going back and forth through. So think about it more as a continuum than very clear stages. But what ETS asks you to do is to think about where that student is. 
And if you just Google stages of second language acquisition, you will find nine stages, 12 stages, four stages, five stages, and they're all called different things. So what you want to do here is to really capture and understand what happens during different stages so you can apply that knowledge to different questions. All right. So we have a, a silent period, and that's the period where students really are just listening. They're sitting, they're listening, they're absorbing information, and they usually have about 500 English words in their vocabulary. Um, then we have early production. This is where students are able to speak in one or two word responses, and they have a little example here for hello or yes. They're able to respond appropriately there. Then we have speech emergence, where the students are able to catch on to things that are being said. They're able to speak in short phrases um, and communicate a little bit more. At this point, they have about 3,000 words. Then we have intermediate fluency. This is where students will be able to form full sentences and they're able to engage in conversations. But they might have some grammar errors. They might get some of those words mixed up. Then we have advanced fluency. So this is where students are comfortable. Um, they understand English like they understand their native language. So it's important to just think in general about these stages because they are pretty straightforward, but what students are able to do in each of these stages will make you need to prepare in the classroom more so for how to assess them because you want to make sure in the classroom that you're actually assessing them on what you're teaching and not on how well they can uh, speak the language at that time. So I also want to let you all know that the silent period is typically called pre-production. Uh, so just make sure that you are aware of that, but it's called some other things as well. Um, so you just need to have a general understanding. And I want to give you an example of that. So I just went over all of this, right? This is one of the examples straight from ETS. Different words, but it's the same idea. So an English language learner who's capable of matching pictures and words and phrases from a story, but cannot yet use those pictures to recreate the sequence of a story, is functioning as which of the following language proficiency levels? Where is this student? Now these words are different, right? They're different, but where do you think that student lands? Okay, so I see B. Brittany, why do you say B? Because they're able, they're able to, to match, match the pictures with the words, with the words and phrases, phrases. But, but they're not able to do it the opposite. Right. So using this, would you say that developing would be more here or here? Maybe early production, maybe. All right. So it would be that would be so developing would be like early production and early production. The student is able to speak a little bit. Right. What this is, is it's indicating that the student cannot really communicate yet. They are they're able to absorb, but they can't fully communicate yet, which is more so entering. Entering would be like the silent period or pre-production, all right? The good thing is, you all, that there are not that many of those questions on the test. But you need to be aware of that type of information so that when you see it, you're able to get it, all right? Thank you for, uh, for trying that one. That was a hard one. So we are now at 515. So we're going to go ahead. I'm actually going to skip these questions here. And we're going to go ahead and go straight to our uh, review. So I'm going to share my second screen and I need you all to let me know when you all are able to see that second screen. Okay. 
And we're going to go back up to question three. Are you all able to see this all right? I can see it. All right, so keeping those, um, great, thank you. Keeping those levels in mind, what do you all think about question three? So this one doesn't even have words. It's level one, level two, level three, level four. You can drop it in the chat or say it out loud. Mia, you said students who are considered, can you, um, are you able to ask your question aloud? Yes, so there's some students, I'm in an ESL class actually for my placement. And um, there are students in the fourth and fifth grade who are considered ELD, English language developers. Yeah. So mm -hmm. would, even if they're in the fourth and fifth grade, would they still be considered early productions? Like they communicate kind of, but I don't know, they're in fourth and fifth grade. It's not about the grades, it's about the stages. So adults also go through this stage. So if you take mm -hmm. me and you drop me off in Spain, then I'm gonna be in that, um, that earlier stage, maybe even in the silent period, right? So mm -hmm. it's not about age. Don't think about it that way. You want to think about it as a continuum of where a person is as they're mm -hmm. learning a language. Okay. Thank you for asking that. That's a great question. Okay, I what also, do you all? Oh, I was going to say, that's a really good question too. And I was noticing on the previous slide, it indicated like a time period and the time period is going to fluctuate. You might have students who are immersed like, you know, they move somewhere, everybody around them is speaking the language that they're learning. So it's going to be a lot easier for them to learn that language than someone who's only learning when they're in, like in class and nobody mm -hmm. at home or around them is communicating in that new language. So the, the time periods also vary in how long they're in those particular stages. Right. Thank, Thank you. you for bringing that out. You're so what do we what do we think this answer is? You all? It looks, it looks like an early one, right? We can mm -hmm. narrow it down to one of the L1 or L2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's look at this. So this English language, language learner who attempts to write simple sentences, but uses a very limited vocabulary. So we know that during the silent period, they're not doing any writing or anything like that. So we really can really be at uh, B, because when we look at levels three or levels four, those higher levels, they're able to communicate more, right? Mm -hmm. So the answer would be B in this case, all right? For the purpose of time, I'm going to go ahead and walk through some of the other uh, literature and informational texts, and then we're going to close it out, all right? So I'm going to stop share. So much information to cover, so little time. All right, so we have uh, some comprehension strategies. And these are some of my favorite to teach because you can teach them at every level. First grade all the way up, you can teach students inferences. Something that um, I remember my teacher doing in first grade and I remember even when I taught sixth grade, we spent time looking at the book covers. We would hold the book up and we would talk about what we think the book is about based on clues. In the same way, you can infer certain things from the text. So inferences are what determine suggestions by clues in the text. So let's use an example. The thunder bloom, sorry, the thunder boomed. My dog hid under the bed and was shaking like a leaf. What can we infer? What do we know from that, that very short statement? OK. 
Okay. The dog is scared. Thank you, Dr. Tillis. The dog is scared. Can we infer anything else? If it's thunder, then it's probably stormy too, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. I think Brittany shared that it's stormy. Yes, very good. Thank you. So, you know that the thunder's loud. Noises can be scary. The text says that the dog was shaking. I can infer that the dog is scared. So that's how inferences work. So it's not a lot of information, but we do it all the time. And when we teach students how to infer from the text, then that unlocks some of those comprehension skills. Summarization is uh, something, one of those earlier skills as well that we all do. So that's determining the main idea. So what's the big idea of this story, right? So if the overall story cannot be matched to the general message, then it's probably not the best answer choice. So if you can't look at that and see what actually happened overall, if it's just a small detail or it's only explaining a section, that's not the best answer choice. So summarization questions to me are kind of like give me questions. If you're, you're paying attention to the text, you'll be able to get these. So when we talk about story elements, this is very important for students to understand. So that's why they test you on this um, for the praxis. You have to understand the setting. So what's going on? How does, uh, where does this story take place and what does that mean? Then we have, in this, in this example, this is about the three little pigs. So this is a fairy tale type of situation. So we know a, little, a few things about fairy tales and how they work out. Then we have characters. So in this case, the characters are animals in the story and they make decisions on how they're going to build the house. You also have the big bad wolf who wants to eat the little pigs, right? So they're motivated by different things and we understand different things based on who are the characters in the story. Then we have the theme, and the theme is going to be that universal message in the story. All stories are also going to have some type of conflict or problem, um, especially in the earlier grades. There's usually a problem that needs to be solved. There's something that's going on, um, and that rising action is where that conflict gets resolved. And then you have key events. So in a summary, for instance, you're going to hit all of the key events that happen. And then the resolution is how everything comes to an end. With main ideal questions, there is a strategy. Um, so I told you these are give me questions. What you want to do is restate the main ideal by jotting it down in your own words. So the great thing about the um, reading test is that the passages aren't that long. So after you read it, you can go ahead and jot down a few things before you look at answer choices. Then when you look at the answer choices, go ahead and eliminate the choices that are too narrow, where they're talking about one detail, too extreme, they're talking about everything, or they go beyond the text. So they're putting in there something that you can't point to the text and say, hey, that happened in the text. So this is not an inference question. This is where you're really just summarizing what happened. So the distractors include true statements, that are just straight from the passage. Those are probably going to be too narrow. So they just take a sentence and they just throw it in there as a main ideal question. That's probably not it. And then statements that use the same words, they need to be double checked. So they might be right, but if they're using the exact same words, more than likely they're too narrow. So this really helps you with main ideal questions to look at what's going on the overall, what's giving the overall big idea of the question. Now, finally, we have the tone and mood questions. So I'm going to really more, more so go over tone than mood because it's, tone is tested more. So tone is the author's attitude towards the text. So the author provides that information in the words that they use. So I'm going to give you all an example in just a second about how you can read a text message and try to kind of figure out, okay, what's the tone of this? How's this person feeling? Because there is an okay, there's an okay, and then there's a mm, okay, right? So you have to figure that out through, through inferences in the text. Then you have mood, and that's the emotional atmosphere of a literary work. 
So that's going to give the reader a feeling. That's the way that it's written to give the reader a feeling. All right. So this is a tone example. So let's say that a person is texting from this beach over here. What are some words that they might use? Serene. 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 That's good. Peaceful. Peaceful. That's good. Breezy. So the tone is going to be more positive, right? Joyful. What if they're texting from the right side, this beach? What words would they use? Crowded. Crowded. Crowded right? Hot. Crowded. Hot. Hot, maybe. Overwhelming. Right? So that might be a more negative tone. So that's what you want to think about when you're thinking about tone. So we are up on time. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and share screen. Can you all see my first screen? I can see I the can exam. See the exam. That's, uh, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So questions 11 through 16, those are an excerpt from the book Black Beauty. And this is something that is, um, the questions are really good and straightforward in terms of going over what's covered on the test. So we don't, let me ask you all right now by a show of hands, if you all could raise your hand on the, using the hand feature. Who would uh, like to continue? Because it'll take me probably about 10 additional minutes to go over this. If you click, um, for those who don't know how to raise their hand, then you can click uh, participants or you can click at the bottom and it has where you can raise your hand there. So I'm not seeing any hands raised, all right? So at this time then, we're gonna go ahead and uh, stop. Hopefully we'll be able to do another session over the summer or in the fall. But what I would like you all to do, this is the next step. What you wanna do is you wanna practice and you also want to go ahead and take the test. Don't wait. Give yourself time. Give yourself the opportunity to have multiple chances to take the test before you have to um, you have to pass it. All right. So just keep that in mind. If you're taking the Praxis Core, do the same thing. You can take these tests in tandem. You will have methods courses uh, during your junior year. If you're in your junior year, that you can also start to take them in tandem. But you want to make sure if you can to get these tests out of the way before you get into these more difficult uh, semesters. All right, because we have students now who have taken it multiple times and it's difficult when you're taking it and you're also in your placements. So over the summer, I would like for you all to commit to that. If you have any questions or if you want to know what the answers are, I'm going to drop a link in the chat with all of the questions and all of the answers to the questions. And if you have any questions for me and you don't understand one of the concepts or you have a question for Dr. Tillis, we are available, all right? So we'll stay on. I'm gonna drop that link in the chat for you all. And if you have any questions, the floor is open now.